chapter 9, as I'm getting a couple other things ready. Hmm. One thing I wanted to share was a, a news article really before we got started today. Um, I was kind of surprised to see. Well, not too surprised, actually, but it's just kind of funny because once again, when two people look at the same thing, they can come up with totally different conclusions, right? Same data, just totally different conclusions while looking at it. And so this is Fox News. This is from just two days ago? No, yesterday. Published November 24th. That's yesterday. So this is just a day old. It says, in one of the most provocative and misunderstood studies of the year, scientists in the U.S. and Switzerland have made an astonishing discovery. All humans alive today are the offspring of a common father and mother. Yes, this is true, people. We now know. Um, it actually says, Anne, Adam, and Eve, who walked the planet. Now, check this out. 100 to 200,000 years ago, which by evolutionary standards is like yesterday. Moreover, and it just goes on talking about how the animals seem like they go back to very similar, just a pair of animals here and there. But it's fascinating because now what they've come up with is, if you know your evolutionary timeline, 100, 200,000 years ago is like yesterday in evolutionary timeline standards. And so they're saying, well, what about all the things that were millions of years old and then, you know, 500 million years old and 300 million? So supposedly there was a mass extinction that took place. And then 100 to 200,000 years ago, it was like a start over. It's like they have all the right information. They just got to figure out the dates and all the other specifics. But it's just funny. This is what... This is yesterday's Fox News. I was listening to another pastor this morning as he was giving his message, and he brought up that article. I'm like, I'm going to have to go find that. I Googled it, and yep, yeah, there it was. I just Googled Fox News, Adam and Eve, and it was the first thing to pop up. But as we're going through the book of Genesis, and we're looking at these guys as they're getting off the boat and all of that, it's just fascinating to see that, yes, <laughs> that more and more science is discovering that the Bible is true. But they have to keep twisting it because they're saying this is like throwing a huge wrench in the gears of what we now know. And so the dates and stuff, they're, well, how is it possible that in so much less time, and I don't have all the dates memorized, but I mean, this really does. It's so, this, saying 100,000 years ago is like saying yesterday in an evolutionary timeline. It's like, this is way shorter time than we thought. I was like, well, just dial it back another 10 times and you're getting even closer. It just, it's just interesting to see that they know that it, had to have been in a shorter period than they've ever thought before, but heaven forbid it would be as short of a period as perhaps the Bible says. We are starting today in Genesis 9, verse 20. Some of you might say, last week we finished in like verse 12 of chapter 8, and that is correct. And as I kind of mentioned, so my goal from here on out is as we move along on Sunday nights, we'll be taking smaller chunks Sunday morning with the intent of really zeroing in, spending some time on one thing. Tonight, we'll be covering all of 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, so we'll cover that then. But I'm going to read verses 20 through 23, and then we will begin. And actually, before I say that, I'm going to really quickly turn on my backup recording because I forgot to do that. All right, so Genesis 9, verses 20 through 23. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Let's pray. Almighty Father, we ask again, as always, that you would open our eyes, open our ears, uh, speak through my mouth, and just touch us all today, God, in our hearts. Transform us. Uh, inspire us to draw near to you. Inspire us to take new bold steps of faith where you call us. 
And I pray, God, that this would minister to our hearts and that this would minister to our souls and that we would leave today, God, yet again, desiring more of you and desiring to walk closer to you in your spirit. Bless your word and bless our hearts, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, now you have to ask yourself, the pastor now is selecting which text he wants to cover in detail. Why does he pick this one weird, awkward, short section of text? But you know what? For weeks, this little section of text has been on my heart, and I've been excited to finally get up to here because there is obviously the literal story of what's being told in this text, but there's also the spiritual application that we can take out of it. And I have, I don't know, I didn't even read this anywhere. This is just strictly, I was reading ahead a month ago or more, and the Lord just spoke to me a message to myself that I needed to hear. And so I wanted to get back to this text. So let's just look at what's going on here to start, though. It says, Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. So again, it's Noah was born and raised a vegetarian, right? Now, God made eating meat permissible, but Noah was probably excited to get back to the diet he had been eating for 600 years. He is 600 years old when the flood stops and he gets off the ark. So after 600 years of eating fruits and vegetables, although I'm sure he was beginning to uh, explore the fine dining of a T-bone steak and maybe a rack of lamb, and you know what? Noah probably even enjoyed some pork chops because... God says earlier in the chapter, right, that all the, the animals, in verse 3, it says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. So there was no mosaic Levitical restrictions on what he could eat. Noah could eat shellfish. He could eat pork. He could even eat bats. I don't know why he want to eat a bat, but bats are forbidden under Levitical law. And so <laughs> that's one of the 613 Levitical laws that I still hold to to this day. I've been successful at never breaking the law at that one point. So, he decides to make a vineyard, and then it says, then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Now, to start off, we don't know for certain, but different scientists who follow a creationist view of science, who believe in the worldwide flood, believe in these vegetarians and and an Eden-like environment before the flood, they question if, if wine would have fermented the same as it does now after the flood, the whole world is a different place now after the flood. That said, we don't know. You can't make it as an excuse, but it's quite possible that maybe the, the drinking of the fruit had a different effect than it used to. We don't know, but Noah did drink of it, and it got to the point where he was drunk. And I actually will say that I don't personally believe that this was um, a total... I don't want to say an innocent mistake, but I think it was just, it was a stumbling point. I think it probably, wine may have existed before the flood, and that, you know what, he's he's 600 years working hard, spent 100 years building the boat. Anyone would want to take a couple drinks after building a boat for 100 years and being stuck on that boat with a bunch of animals for a whole year. But he drank a little too much. Speaking of drinking too much, I've got a tea back there somewhere, and if someone can find it and bring it to me, you'd be my savior. It might be the one by the camera. I'm just really thirsty myself, all this talking of drinking wine. But do not worry, I will not become uncovered in my tent. Uh, I've got that part. I've got the self-control. But that's what happened, right? Is he, He's drinking, he gets drunk. And you know, actually, as you drink, your body temp actually increases with drunkenness. I know none of you have ever gotten drunk, so you wouldn't have to worry about that. But that was a joke. Um, but the whole thing is, is that he, he just, in a drunken you know, stupor. He takes off his, his robe, hangs it up on the hook, <laughs> stumbles on into his tent, and just flops down on the bed. I'm just assuming he's just passed out now, drunk, and is laying there sprawled out on the floor of his tent. And in verse 22, we see Ham show up. And right off the bat, it calls him the father of Canaan, and that's going to be more of a topic for tonight. But Canaan's going to be the father of the Canaanites. And that's kind of a big name and a big deal to the whole book of the Bible, the whole Old Testament. The Canaanites played a major role. So they're identifying that he's the father of Canaan right off the bat. But Ham comes in, and it says he saw the nakedness of his father. 
Now, that word saw there, to see, to look at, um, it's the normal word for to see, but in the Hebrew, it's put in the imperfect, imperfect tense. This is where the grammar stuff plays a role. And if you read, you know, like the Strong's Concordance about what does that imperfect tense imply, and it's, it's a one-time action, but it has the implication of something that's going on for an extended period of time. It's not something I was just like a glance. It implies to gaze and even could be defined as to inspect. It's not just a little quick thing. And we don't want to spend too much time focusing on this, but the whole thing was is that, you see, I'm sure at some point having to shower and all those other things, you know, fathers and sons, they probably were naked together at some point in time. Guys go to the gym. There's a locker room. People change their clothes in front of each other. That's not necessarily a weird thing. Some people probably don't like the idea of changing their clothes at the public pool, but it's kind of a normal thing. But this means to gaze. I mean, he was taking the time to make an observation. Now, truly, I don't believe, and I think most scholars agree, this isn't necessarily, you could take this to turn into some kind of a weird incestual, homosexual attraction, but I don't think that was it. If you follow the descendants of Ham, and tonight we'll look at more about Ham and his offspring and all the people that came from Ham, there's a good chance that this was the one son who maybe had some moral issues more so than the other two. He may have been a believer, but he was probably a carnal believer. And this probably had to do more with just usurping his father's authority. Just, here's Noah. Oh, the spiritual guy, 500 years he walks to the Lord. God talks to Noah. And here's the son who's just kind of just mocking his dad. So don't take this as like a, a weird, twisted sexual thing. It's just as much as, oh, man, look what dad did. What a fool. And he's sitting there, and he's kind of just dwelling on, look what dad did. He messed up. He screwed up. Look at that guy. And so he's taking it in. It's an extended thing. And so what does he do with that? He sees his father's mistake, and I think it was. Noah messed up. But he goes out and he talks to his brothers now. Hey, guys, you know dad, the spiritual one, the, the patriarch of the family? Go check out what he's done now. He's failed. He's fallen. He's messed up. And he goes out to tell Shem and Japheth. It says in verse 23, but Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, and they went backward, covering the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now, here's just an interesting picture of these guys doing it this way. But in a nutshell, they knew that their dad was going to be in this exposing position in this place of, you know, no one wants to get caught like that. And so they are trying to come up with what's the best plan? What, what, okay, how are we going to do this? Because we want to cover him up, but obviously I don't want to go in there and see him like that. You don't want to go see him like that. And more than that, dad probably doesn't want us seeing him like that. Well, maybe... Maybe if you get this, and I'll get this, and we're just going backwards, right? We'll just kind of stumble, we'll walk slow, and we'll walk together. And when you kind of kick and feel dad's foot, we're just going to kind of toss it back on him, you know? And it seems like we'll go and we'll look and we'll make sure he's covered up and we'll let dad sober up and, and figure out how things are going. And, and it, it says in verse 24, we didn't read that far ahead, but it says Noah woke up from his wine. So, I mean, he was passed out because of the wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. That word, even his youngest son, saying that Ham was the youngest of the three. So he realized that, I mean, it says what Ham had done to him. Again, this wasn't just like a little thing. I mean, it was taken as an action of a kind of an attack. He did something that was most definitely inappropriate, and it was something that shouldn't have been done. There's the end of the text I wanted to cover. But in this now, we see so much more because here's the whole situation is that we have a group of believers, right? Here's four believers in this account. We have Noah, the one who messed up. 
he messed up and he left himself essentially open to be discriminated, to be poked at, to be made a spectacle of. You've got Ham, who I believe was a believer. But he's there exposing his dad and all that his dad had gone through and the, the mistakes his dad made. And then you have Shem and Japheth. Here they are trying to cover their father in the most humble and the most protective way that they could come up with. And this just spoke to my heart as I was reading through it, just about how we deal with things in the church body. How do we handle sin? How do we handle each other's sins when things come up? Because even the Noahs in the group here, you know, maybe you've been walking with the Lord for 600 years. (laughs) But the idea is, is you might have had an almost flawless record, but we screw up. We make mistakes, we stumble, and we do things that are not very Christian-like. And how do our brothers, his sons, but amongst us, it's brothers and sisters, how do we handle people when they stumble in sin, when they end up in a place they shouldn't be? We've got options here. There's to mock and expose. Now, was Ham doing anything? Because I, I don't want to confuse this at all. So as I dive further today, Ham was not exposing wickedness like exposing a heresy. He was not exposing some secret thing Noah was doing and trying to let people know, no, 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 he's leading them astray. No, he is mocking for the sake of mocking. He's exposing for the sake of embarrassing. It has nothing to do with exposing wickedness because we are called to expose wickedness. You know, if there is a pastor out there who is pulling one over on his church, you know, you can call him out. You can call him out one-on-one, and if that doesn't work, you can call him out in front of everyone. But this is an honest mistake, a stumbling to transgress and just to fall, to trespass. You're just, you mess up. But the other sons, they choose to cover his sins. They find a way to make it so that it's not obvious and known to everyone else. And so I'm just going to go to some New Testament parallel passages. But as we flip our way to the New Testament, just here's just a couple verses to, to take into mind, right? Psalm 31 32 verse 1 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And it is a blessing. I don't know how many of you can think about it, but I can think about how many times God's let me get away with something. He dealt with me, but praise the Lord, you know, he dealt with me in a one-on-one kind of way. He got me to get through the thing I was dealing with lest I had continued in it, and then it become a big explosive issue. But it is a blessing. And here's where we get to the issue of actually gossip. It's that dirty word that we all know is wrong, but so often it's easy for us believers to call it something else, to call it a prayer request, to call it just I'm concerned and want to know about what's going on in that person's life. But Proverbs 11.13 says, A talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. And once again, this is not covering up a sin, you know, and kind of sweeping it under the rug, as some churches have been known and some very infamously known for taking the sins of their leaders and just sweeping it under the rug and acting like it didn't happen. That's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about here is grace. This is mercy. This is like someone slipped up It is kind of a no harm, no foul. And we could just let everyone know that they're an idiot. (laughs) Or we could try and work with them and restore them and build them up. It says, an ungodly man digs up evil, and it is on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. Proverbs 16, 27 and 28. You're kind of getting the heart of behind this now? It's an ungodly thing. Let's say this again one more time. It's an ungodly thing to try and dig up evil. So often we want to hear juicy facts of a situation, but it's an ungodly thing of an ungodly man or woman to try and have this desire, I want to know more. How did that happen? How did it play out? What did they say? That's actually a sinful desire in your heart crying out. And it's on his lips like a burning fire because the second you hear it, (laughs) good luck keeping it a secret. It's that same desire to find the juicy details where we want to tell other people 
And you know what a secret is, right? It's something you only tell one person at a time. It's a secret, so I'll just tell Daniel, right? Now, you don't tell anyone, okay? But then I, mean, I can tell Diane, too. Now, you don't tell anyone. And, I mean, Daniel will tell Mila because that's his wife, and it's, so you can't keep a secret from your wife, right? And then Mila, she can tell, like, Alyssa because that's, like, her sister-in-law, and that's, like, a secret. You know, Alyssa, she's dating Alex. She can tell Alex, and he's best friends with Thomas. And as long as we keep it a secret, the whole church will not know by nightfall. But that's the way it works, and it is a perverse man, so strife. This is what happens when we start sharing these things with each other, and a whisper separates the best of friends. And that's the thing, is we, we think we're just whispering these things out. But truly, it creates division in the church. It creates a lack of unity. It tears things apart as we share these little things that could be taken as secrets. And, you know, let's flip to Ephesians 4. While we're headed over that way, you know, I just want to share, you know, this, this section of text isn't because we have a lot of gossipers in our church and we have a lot of gossip going on in our church. It's because there is a crazy, huge amount of unchecked gossip going on in the church, and I would assume it would include ours too. Because this is so human nature of all people. And this is one of those sins. Like, I was looking up some of those lists of sins, and it's crazy to see, you know, things like gossip and other things. They get listed amongst other sins. That, well, that's a horrible sin, but this is just sharing a little thing here or there. But truly, I think if you want to grow as a Christian, if you want to draw near the Lord, and you want to see our church body grow, thrive, and succeed. I think this is something that every single person has to keep in mind, that how do we deal with other brothers and sisters when they fall into sin? And today I'm also trying to separate calling out an unbeliever and letting their sin be known to them, making them realize they're in transgression with God's law and that they need a savior, right? That's a little different. That's kind of getting in their face because they're going to hell without recognizing that they're a sinner in need of a savior. But when we have saved people who stumble and fall. How do we deal? In verse 29 of chapter 4 of Ephesians, it says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification? This is just natural conversation amongst believers. Every word we speak to one another should go through the filter of, is what I'm saying Good for necessary edification. Now, you might want to see your brother grow or your sister keeps doing the same thing again and again. You might want to help that person. But again, what you're saying, is that actually necessary for edification or are we just venting again about how A or B is not where we wish they were? And that it may impart grace to the hearers. When you bring up your brother who's stumbling, because maybe you are trying to address an issue, maybe you are trying to see them grow, the people hearing you, are they hearing grace? Or are they just hearing complaints? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, that evil speaking, I don't know which Bible you have and which translation, but evil speaking is blasphemia, blasphemia in the Greek. Now we get our word blaspheme from, but here it means to slander. It's a detraction from them, right? It's injurious to another's good name. This is how the Strong's Concordance defines that word. It's not just evil speaking like speaking of witchcraft or it's not cursing or, right? No, that word there, it means to speak of another in a way in which to slander them or to take away from their good name. You know, I learned some lessons earlier on in my faith when I got rebuked by more mature believers as I was out trying to actually sincerely even put out prayer requests. I've got a cousin, and this is what they're going through. 
And I started to talk about the situation going on in their marriage. And then the person just stopped me. He's like, you stop right there. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? They need prayer. Their marriage, this and that, this and that. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, you have just slandered your cousins in front of me. You have just told me about stuff that I didn't need to know. You just now put a picture in my head that I cannot take out. I don't even know your cousins, but if I met them, what is the first thing I'm going to think now? Man, I felt like a, a midget of a man because they were right. They called me out, and I was like, whoa, okay, wow. Here I was just trying to share some prayer requests, but you're right. You can just pray for my cousins, and God knows the rest, doesn't he? God doesn't need us to give every single little detail. Who's done what, and what did they do in return? Verse 32 says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Very seldom do I think I treat others with the fullness of the heart of God who forgave me. And so often I want everyone else to treat me, you know, just like God treats me, with so much grace and mercy and compassion. Yet as I'm trying to become more Christ-like, this is kind of the stuff that he calls us to. We've got one last text, and we're going to flip back to Galatians 6. So you're probably only about a page or two away from Galatians chapter 6. But again, this is this issue of whether you call it gossip or slandering or whatever else it may be, it's just that as we try and grow into the image of Christ, God is going to refine us and he's going to remind us of a higher calling. And this is watching the words that we speak and the things that come out of our mouths. Galatians 6, verse 1, it says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken by any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. This is a deep verse to kind of break down and take a look at piece by piece. So it's saying, brethren. So it's a command for us. It's a command for the church, right? And this is, I think, dealing with the church. This is not dealing necessarily with your unbelieving family and friends, though you don't need to slander them as well. But we're going to deal with a brother or a sister. Now, we know we shouldn't gossip. What should we do? I'm ham. What should I do? If a man is overtaken in any trespass. I looked up overtaken in the Greek. You want to know what the word in the Greek means? Overtaken. Go figure. Sometimes they get it right, it seems. No, it means overtaken. What does it mean to be overtaken? In my Bible, it actually says in the, in the margin, caught is a synonym you could put there. You see, I'm not talking about a brother who's cheating on his wife. That guy knows what he's doing, right? That's like a big deal because it's an act of active rebellion against the Lord. But so often... We treat those types of things as we treat trespasses. Now, paraptima, a trespass, paraptima in the Greek, it means to fall aside, or it's a lapse or deviation from the truth or uprightness. It's the same word, again, as to stumble. That's the word. Now, if a brother is stumbling, they're walking the walk, but they trip, they fall. And maybe the person just trips and falls so much, you might think they just have a limp or something because it seems like they're always stumbling on the same problem again and again. But you realize that must just be the sin that they really struggle with. Now, this could be other sins that we might think of as bigger sins, but we have to keep these in mind. This is like your spouse more than likely has a few sinful tendencies and behaviors and attitudes that they trespass in often. I know my spouse has them, and I know that I have them. This is something that I just, I, I seem to stumble in it over and over again. 
And I, I don't desire to, but I, I get upset. And maybe it's an anger thing for you. Maybe it's a lust thing. Maybe it's an envy or a greed thing. Maybe it's gossip. <laughs> maybe that, in fact, is the thing you stumble in not realizing it. And it overtakes the person. Look at the command here. This is probably one of the most humbling things you could read. It says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Okay? So the next time you get in a fight with your spouse or with a friend or with a family member or with your parents or with your kids, the one who's supposed to essentially eat crow and try to restore the other person rather than tear them down and prove to them they're wrong and dumb and you are in sin and in error and I'm going to explain to you why you are to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. If you're the spiritual one, that's your job. So every, every married couple right now should probably establish who the spiritual one is because you'll be the one to act first and to do this. And then it says, consider yourself lest you be tempted. Well, what kind of temptation could that be? I'll give you two. One is if it's a sin that you might stumble in, you could fall into it too. If you struggle, you know, with alcoholism, you might not be the one who should go retrieve your friend from the bar. Just a thought. But what about what we were reading about? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a temptation to, to gossip. It's a temptation to not restore them in a gentle way, right? It's a temptation to, to fight back. It's a temptation to do all the things wrong, to judge them, to let them know how wicked they are, that you are a wicked sinner, and I can't believe you're sinning right now, you know? Praise the Lord during this marital argument. The Lord has at least reminded me of how righteous I am, that you are in the wrong, and I will take you now to the Word to show you how wrong you are in this situation, and I will explain. But a spirit of gentleness, and I'm actually even going to flip just a page back to Ephesians 4.2. It says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. That's the calling of us believers as we work with each other as believers. In verse 2 of Ephesians, or Galatians 6, it said, bear one another's burdens. That's their troubles, their heavinesses. You know what? If you struggle with an attitude, you struggle with a sinful attitude. You get angry too easy. You become self-righteous too easy. You struggle with pride. You struggle with fear because that's sinful because we should not fear anything with God on our side. It becomes kind of heavy on you. It becomes a burden. We can beat ourselves up. So this tells us to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, right? Jesus summarized the whole law in two things, love God and love one another. Well, how do I love one another? Well, serve them and bear their burdens with them. Oh, that's just this person. And I know that they struggle with anger. And every time they get angry, as we're trying to work together on a church project, or as we're trying to, you know, start our day or whatever it is, I could beat them up over it, remind them you're sinning again, or I could just learn to bear their burden and eat a little crow, and just be like, you know what? I know that they struggle with this, and this is their burden, and they trespass. They fall into it. Every now and then it overtakes them, and so I'm going to try my best to be gentle and Christ-like to this brother or sister in the Lord and just lovingly coax them back in to a right attitude and mind. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. <laughs> I'll tell you what, when other people are caught in their little trespasses, it's easy for just a moment to maybe think you're something. <laughs> Come on. That's verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I mean, that's the thing. I start thinking I'm somebody when other people are struggling in their sins, but it happens to be my area of strength. I'm good at this, and I start thinking I'm a somebody but I'll tell you what, the more I draw near to God, the more he really clearly points out to me that I'm a nobody. You know, I pray, think of it this way. This is my goal, some life goals. I'll share some life goals with you guys. And this is not about competition. This is about my personal enrichment. I hope to be the most holy pastor in this whole town. I hope to be the most prayerful pastor 
in this whole town. I hope to be the most in the word pastor in this whole town. I really mean those three things. And I hope to be the most broken mess of a pastor up at the pulpit in this whole town. Because as I seek the Lord in, his, in holiness, I realize how unholy I truly am. As I seek him in prayer, he reminds me how desperately I need him. As I go in the word, it's like looking to a mirror, reminding me of how desperately I need a savior. And I'm not going to hopefully ever think something of myself. Because I'm realizing, man, I'm a nobody. And when you finally realize you're a nobody, it's so much easier to help the other nobodies you're working with and just, we got to bear through this together because we're not getting through it alone. Verse 4 says, let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, not in another. Looking at, (laughs) oh, they have those struggles, but man, I need to look at my own stuff. For each one shall bear his own load. I think God has given us things. He's given us our own sinful struggles so that we can become sanctified and more holy as we learn to work through those things, as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We learn to work through these struggles. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Hey, I'm teaching, so share things with me. It sounds like a great verse. Verse 7, though, do not be deceived, focusing on getting to the end of verse 10 here. God is not mocked, right? Whatever a man sows, then he will, that he will also reap. So can I tell you this, guys? If if you have a brother or sister who's in sin and they're irritating you, I'm not alone in this, I hope, that there are people who begin to irritate me because I'm pouring into them and it doesn't seem to take. It doesn't matter how much parenting advice you can give someone. They may never actually put it to application. You can give them financial advice and they're still going to just go blow all their money. You give them spiritual advice and they don't take... We all can do that. You see someone and you're trying to help them. You're trying to, you know, and, and it can be frustrating. But you know what? I'm called to help them and bear their burdens and work with them. God will make sure that they reap what they sow, and they will. They don't need me to remind them that it's going to happen. They will reap what they've sown. And so it's not my job to be the, uh, the reaper of their own sowing. I let them take care of their problems, and they're going to find out. Because he who sows the flesh, verse 8, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows the Spirit will out of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You know, it's, it will have a cost and a toll when we never give up some of those little things we're trying to work through. And with the help of our brother, that might be possible. And the last two verses, which I could probably bring up at church every week if I could find a way to sneak them in. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If you're going to have any slightest chance to succeed in verses 1 and 2, if you are going to have the slightest chance of actually helping the weaker brothers and sisters, bearing their burdens, working with people, ignoring and and covering when they have mess-ups. They sin, you know, I'm just going to cover it. I'm going to help you through this. I'm going to give you yet another hand up. It would be easy to grow weary. I've helped that guy a thousand times, and we want to say we're through with it. Not only do we want to say we're through with it, we want to complain to our friends about how much we've helped that guy, and he still hasn't learned yet. But that guy's out there reaping what he's sown, He'll he'll realize that our advice was good. But then it says, if we don't grow weary, in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And this is where I want to encourage you guys is that, I don't know, just a few times recently in conversation, this idea has come up is, you know, serving the Lord can be very tiring. And it can be time-consuming. And it can be difficult. More often than not, God does not call us when we are full and ready to dive in and I have all this abundance of time. I might as well go and serve the Lord. No, he puts it on your heart when you're the busiest you've ever been. But he's still saying, I want the first fruits of your life. But you know what? If you're doing it with the right heart and you're serving the Lord, I can tell people from my personal experience of where I am in, that, where I am in life at this moment, man, I am exhausted but it's worth every second. It's worth every bit of it. 
Do you regret it? Not for a second. You tired? Oh, yeah, I'm tired. Do you get a little stressed out? Oh, you might call it that, yeah. But, it, but I trust that God's at work. I know that he's moving. Do you want to quit? No way. I'm not trading this for anything. I'm not going to let that little bit of weariness get to my head because I know I'm going to reap. I know that God will reward. Whether in this life or the next, I know that God will reward. And therefore, verse 10, as we have opportunity, every time God puts the opportunity in front of us, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. And it's that reminder that we are supposed to be serving all people. We are supposed to be loving to all people. But you know what? Priority number one, it's our brothers and sisters. It truly is. It is taking care of those in our household, that we're looking out for each other. If I can't bear the burdens of you guys, how am I supposed to bear the burdens of the heathen on the street? Truly, that we need to be able to bear with each other, grow with each other, learn from each other. And slowly but surely, we start picking up. Ah, you know, that's Dale. He just gets that way, you know? Or that's Diane. You know, she has this thing. Or that's Sandy. And Sandy, you know, and you lie. Oh, well, that's Joe. He just talks too much, you know? Just smile and nod. Bear with him, okay? He's working that sin out of his life. Just, yeah, uh-huh. And, you know, and then just make sure you listen for some key words so you can repeat something back to him. Make him think you're listening. But it's, a, it's the truth, though. You learn. People have got their things, and you learn to work with them, and that's bearing those burdens. So just so I don't speak for too sinfully long, I'll end right there on a high note. But Noah had a trespass. He done messed up. One of his sons wanted to expose him, wanted to let others know about the mistake that he made, and he was just looking to make the problem worse. But the other two sons, amongst themselves, how can we cover his sins? How can we make this, how can we fix this problem and do it in the most respectful way to that person as possible? How can we do it in a way that we're not adding to the problem? I'm going to walk in backwards. We're going to lay that blanket down. That way he doesn't have to be embarrassed. Adding to the sin. They could have sat back with the popcorn. At that time, they had a bit of vineyards. I'm assuming there was maybe a cornfield at that time and fire, so they could have had popcorn. Maybe, you know, Canaan was born at this point. This wasn't immediately after the flood. Right? Canaan was already born, so Ham had already had sons. So time had gone by. They could have brought the whole family over. Look what Grandpa Noah did. But instead, the two of the sons decided to restore him in a spirit of gentleness. They bared with his burden. They, they bared with him through that weak choice, and they restored him. I think that's what we're called to as a church. And so I pray that God would help us keep that mindset. How can I bear with the burdens of others? How can I help cover sin rather than just exposing it when it's in a healthy amongst brothers kind of way? Again, this is not about exposing evil or hiding things under the rug. It's about not making a spectacle out of someone's sincere mistake, someone who is walking with the Lord. Because you know you can't stumble if you're not walking, right? People can be either in sin, there's one place, there's the people walking in the Spirit, the believers, they can stumble. If you're in sin, there's no place to stumble. You're just waiting in it already. So let's pray that God would just speak to our hearts today and show us how we can grow and apply this and use this to bless one another. Father God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you just for what you've spoken to us today. And Lord, I just pray we can put this stuff to use. I pray that we can use this in our marriages, 